I'm Matt Wilhelmy. I'm the owner of Strategic Voyages Business Consultants. I'm also the author of Taboo Business Questions. And today I'm joined by Rebecca Schutte. She is a startup veteran with roots in the agency space. She's the founder and chief marketer at Start to Scale. She's a fractional CMO, knows all things venture capital and private equity focused on startups. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Matt. I'm excited to continue our conversation. Yeah, in the second episode, I do like to chat with my guests about some cautionary tales because I think sometimes it's a little bit inauthentic to think that every situation goes perfectly smooth, everybody listens to our advice, uh, there's never anybody that does anything wrong and just like, it's just not really the way it works. And so what I found a lot of value in kind of doing is talking with my guests about some of those situations that maybe don't go quite right. And you brought up a couple of really interesting uh, stories, and I'd love to kind of unpack those with you and talk through some of the details. The first one that you told me about was um, this company, this this fallacy, really, where the marketing's job is only to fill the top of the funnel, and that's it. And um, obviously, there's a lot more there, which we'll get into. Um, I've got a cautionary tale as well, which we'll unpack in um, a couple of minutes. But the second, uh, the cautionary tale that I'd like to tell is more related to a SaaS company that did not have a predictable marketing strategy. And as I'm sure you could guess, that's not going to go well, but they were convinced that they would do just fine. Um, but then the third one, the one that you're going to tell is about a different SaaS company who thought that events uh, were a waste of money. And I don't know if that's trade shows or other types of events, but um, I'm sure we'll get into it uh, when we unpack that one. But the first one, like I mentioned, the fallacy of thinking that marketing's job is to fill the top, the only job is to fill the top of the funnel. Can you tell me more about that one? Yeah, so that belief isn't isn't that unique to this particular startup. This one is just, just the one that I'm gonna talk about today, but I've I've run into, especially actually a, a lot of heads of sales that have have come to me and they're like, yeah, yeah, just, just fill the top of the funnel. If you do that, I'll take care of everything else. Um, considering I play in the startup space, I don't know, maybe big enterprises, they have the budget to just continuously fill that top of, top of the funnel. But I think in today's environment, you know, everyone is budget con conscious and it's just a very expensive value proposition to say, all right, I'm just going to pump a ton of money in there and I'm going to fill that top of the funnel. So instead, I try to um, teach all of my uh, startup founders that the role of marketing is really to help the business generate revenue efficiently. So what that means is not just sales generating revenue, it means the business generating that revenue efficiently. So some of that is helping fill that top of the funnel, but some of that is optimizing the funnel. So making sure that the sales team is armed with the right information so that they can tell a compelling story and pull those leads down the funnel, nurture leads when they come in so that they actually turn into pipeline in the future. Um, but that being said, uh, like many marketers, I'm being measured by KPIs. And at this organization, that KPI was that top of funnel. So, okay, I know how to do that great, I'm gonna fill that top of funnel. In this organization, I had a great partner on the sales team. I just had, you know, he was a killer, or there were, there were killer sales reps that they were gonna close every deal I threw their way. So if I got a lead, they knew how to tell the story and they were gonna get it done so that they could earn their commission. Um, what we recognized uh, a few months in is that our, MRR was growing. So our net, our new MRR was growing, but our total MRR was falling. So what was what we diagnosed was we had a churn issue. We had a great sales team uh, who was closing deals, but these deals were not a great fit for us. We were not able to service them and hold on to them in a long-term um, basis. Uh, this company, they were a tech-enabled services firm. We did have some decent upfront costs in onboarding customers. So if we didn't retain them for you know 18 months or so, it was a losing uh, dollar proposition to the business uh, if we churned that quickly. So what did we do at that point in time? Well, finally, the CEO actually recognized, okay, yes, 
marketing can do more than fill the top of the funnel. Let's turn to marketing to help us, you know, right this ship and solve the biggest burning issue, which was the churn issue. Um, and so what we did at that point in time, so one, we paused our marketing um, spend, you know, or at least we, we scaled it down. It does not make sense to fill that funnel and and uh, outlay a bunch of cash if you're only going to be churning those customers. So that was number one. Number two was actually refining the ideal customer profile. So what do our customers look like who are who stay with us for the longest period of time? What do they look like? And how can I go after more customers that look like that? Um, and then finally, enhancing the customer engagement. So how can you have a unified customer experience all the way from, you know, first touch point, where do they first become aware of org our organization, all the way through the sales process and then to the actual customer experience. So we did that by enhancing our um, the delivery of our service and product, as well as um, the quarterly business reviews. So, and again, that was something that marketing helped weave throughout that entire process because retention is a full company um, problem. It's not just your customer success team's problem. Wow. So you were really able to deliver a lot of value to that client. You know, I think about creating um, a lot of financial uh, forecasts and doing some predictability models. And if you're not able to have kind of a longevity of a lifetime, you know, value with that client, you're spending a ton of money to acquire some clients you are only keeping for a few months or not even Absolutely. a year. And it's very expensive. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, you have to fix your leaky bucket. That's problem number one. I love that. I'm going to keep that in the back of my hat. Fix the <laughs> leaky bucket. Um, but that actually is a really interesting segue because, you know, this next story, the one that I wanted to tell um, is a very similar story. But um, this SaaS company, you know, they had a, a really great product that they offered, um, you know, as a service uh, to the market. But they weren't really clear on who their target market was. They didn't really have a clear picture of a marketing strategy. And um, when I was introduced to them, they wanted my help putting together an investor deck to go out and get venture capital money. I'm sure that you're familiar with this process, right? Finance guy comes in, wants to see some reports, wants to use Excel, create some fancy you know, tables, things like that. Well, when I was talking to whoever was in charge of their marketing, um, what I began to pick up was that they had shifted strategies several times over the last few years to the point where they couldn't really tell me what the strategy was. And so you're going to love this. When I asked them what they thought the revenue was going to grow, they said probably about 10%. And I said, okay, well, that's okay, but why? And they're like, well, because that's what, you know, we just like think that that's what we're going to grow. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, like that's not going to work in a deck. And so um, this isn't going to, you know, we need to change some things. Hope um, is not a strategy, I, right? <laughs> hope is not a strategy. Um, I would not put that in my deck uh, <laughs> that I would try and convince an investor to give you some money with. And so, um, you know, funny enough, we were able to kind of get to the bottom of some of the tracking mechanisms that needed to be put in place. Um, and actually it changed a little bit of the ask that we were going to the investors. Um, we needed to get some of those things shored up before we could go out and get a bigger ask. And so um, it worked out, but I think that it was eye-opening from the people internally. It was almost like they knew what the problem was, but they yeah. didn't want to say anything because they were afraid of their jobs being terminated or um, I've heard of other, this wasn't this person's company, but another company was just, they were like, literally, they said they were afraid of their boss yelling. I'm like, okay, like I, I get it. I don't want to make that sound like that's not a big deal, but like, that's not the end of the world, but maybe we should have a little bit more cordial conversations. And so anyway, um, it's a great reminder, Rebecca, that the finance team and the marketing team can be best friends. And we really should, you know, kind of be playing in the same sandbox and kind of moving the company in the same direction because I've worked with other marketing professionals who have had much better stories about how they're going to grow their company. And it's much more uh, different just pulling that information out copy and pasting sometimes yeah. their strategy into a deck to say, look, I can show you why the numbers are going to grow because the marketing team has these different metrics and OKRs and different milestones. It just, it works so much better when we're on the same page. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like in that there was, you know, yes, there was some foundational issues there on the marketing side, but it also sounds like there were some cultural issues. And that's what I recognize a lot of times. Um, I think one of the reasons why I've stayed in the startup space is because so many startups embrace kind of a fail fast mentality. And you should you should be um, loud about your failures because that is how the organization is going to learn as quickly as possible and then move on to the next thing, right? You don't want your whole staff to be making the same mistakes over and over again, but the only way you can do that is if your staff is comfortable with saying, you know what, I tried this thing, it didn't work. We need to move on to something else. And this is why I think it didn't work. Um, so yeah, if there was a, a culture of fear there, that's a, that's a difficult way to then, to then be successful. I wanna highlight something you just said, because I think this is missed by a lot of folks. And what you just said is so, so important, which is your people are sometimes scared of bringing the problems to the surface. Mm -hmm. But I think what they need to remember is nobody wants to be around somebody who only has critical and only sees problems. Okay. And so you have to very carefully be able to articulate those problems and have a solution ready to go. If you don't, then you're gonna be known as the person who's just kind of the negative Nancy in the room yeah. instead of you know a problem solver. Um, and so there's a very difference there. You brought it up very well. I just felt like it was important to, to highlight again. Um, I'm really interested in this next company though, because you said that the SaaS company thought that events were a waste of money. I'd love to hear more about that one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yes, this one was events are a waste of money, but it's also just kind of uh, thinking, making your decisions based on gut rather than data. And that I think is a, is a transferable problem I, I see in many places. Um, well, just like relationships, uh, your employers or your coworkers come to the table with baggage, right? The baggage that I walked into with this organization was that I was replacing a previous marketer um, who, while this was a startup, uh, her previous experience had been at a, within the same industry, but at a much larger organization. So she came great with industry knowledge. The downside was that she was used to operating with much larger budgets. And so she burned through a lot of cash pretty quickly, which is not always great when you're in a, an early stage startup. Um, in this instance, you know, while I think some of her execution was poor, I think there was um, the CEO and CFO were coming to the table fearful of repeating those mistakes again, right? So they were they were thinking, okay, everything she did should just be thrown out, and you should you should come to the table again. So one of the things that one of the tactics and channels that she had relied on heavily were events. Uh, additionally, one, one specific event producer had had some missteps for the organization and it, it had not been a great experience. And so, you know, the CFO said to me, well, we're never investing in events again. And we're definitely never doing an event with this producer again, because, you know, that, that was a mess. Um, and great. I think one, whenever a CMO comes into a new organization, you absolutely should pull your team about what was successful, what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past. And getting that subjective information is super, super important, but it needs to be layered onto the objective data that you can actually pull from a CRM. So this company, actually, they had a decent CRM. There, there still needed to be some enhancements, which is very common for startups. Um, but I was able to take, OK, this is what they're telling me. Let me actually do a, a backwards analysis and look at the attribution of our pipeline as it exists today, the actual revenue that's been closed, and where did it come from? And what it underlined for me was that events happen to be a good strategy for us for both generating not just leads because i think there is there is you know people the people who attend events often like events because they're fun you talk to a lot of people it doesn't always result in revenue right and events can be very expensive so i don't think it's a great strategy for every startup but for this particular startup we were creating a new category so there was not natural 
inbound interest in digital channels, right? We couldn't just play SEO because people weren't looking for our solution. Um, so events were great. We could go out there, talk to our buyers in person, communicate the problem, which they were very um, familiar with the problem. What they weren't familiar with was that there was a solution to this problem. They were dealing with this problem on their own using kind of manual solutions within their own organizations. So we needed to do that. Events happened to be a great strategy for it. Um, and what I recognized, this was, again, why, why marketers should be building relationships with their finance counterparts. You know, when I, when I brought this story to the CFO's um, table, he was like, oh, OK, you know, my mistake. I thought that this was wrong, but you showed me the data that says, right, it's 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 right. And I also, you know, continued to build that trust by saying, okay, so for future investments, for every show we go to, I am going to have a defined lead goal and opportunity goal for this, right? We're not just gonna show up and hope that something's going to happen. This is what I think we are generating. And then it's easy for the CFO to say, great. And then moving forward, I'm going to be very transparent when I report out on the results of that. Great, I thought this event was going to produce X number of leads, it produced Y. If Y was greater than X, we're going to do this event again. If it was less than X, well, then I'm going to let you know either no, we're not going to invest in this again, or we failed because of this lack of execution, which we're fixing in our playbook moving forward. Uh, and, you know, building relationships like that, that's that's a winning combination for finance and marketing. Yeah, you talk about winning combinations. I mean, it's not every CEO that's willing and able to say, I did something wrong and yes. thank you for showing me the data. So that sounds like a very mature CEO, you know, somebody who um, maybe is aware, but they don't know everything. Um, yeah. And sometimes is maybe admitting that they make it, made a decision based on gut, but is open to new data yes. from which to make new decisions. That's just, um, that's open-mindedness. And that's, that's encouraging to hear that those folks are out there. Yeah, um, absolutely. just to remind our viewers where we're at, um, I'm talking with Rebecca Schutte. She's a startup veteran with uh, roots in the agency space, founder and chief marketer at Start to Scale, fractional CMO, all things venture capital and private equity focused um, around startups, um, multiple successful uh, fundraising campaigns, it looks like, with um, some different marketing work that you've done. And so just really appreciative of your time kind of unpacking these different cautionary tales. I hope that everybody uh, stays tuned for our third episode as Rebecca and I present some solutions to our very original case study um, that had some very specific issues like um, overcoming objections and what that actually means in terms of the life cycle of a client, uh, marketing producing the wrong leads, marketing not telling the right story, um, if they're even telling a story at all, and then not really having true visibility into the data and what pitfalls that might um, have in store. And so really excited to unpack these a little bit further and get some solutions with Rebecca Schutte in our next episode. I hope you stay tuned. Thanks, Matt.